Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to um, Rafa's channel's um, Arts and Lessons from Leadership panel. Um, today, we'll be talking about um, the, 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 the potential conversation and um, sort of parallels between artists in the art world and uh, leaders um, in different fields. Um, politics, finance, uh, technology, and in the face of crisis, um, how um, the way artists approach the crisis, how, uh, how different leaders can, um, I guess, learn from them is um, the right way to say it. Um, and, and, and today uh, we're with um, um, different experts in the field and in the arts. Um, so I'd like to first introduce um, the panelists today. And, and starting myself, my name is Osman Jani Arabakan. I'm a New York-based uh, writer. Um, and I'll be moderating this panel today. Um, and um, today uh, we are um, we're with uh, Louis Burry, the author of Exercise and Criticism published by Dalkey Archives Press, and he's an, associate, he's an associate professor of English at Hustle Community College at CUNY. He contributes regularly to art magazines, the type allergic bomb, um, as well as art in America. We uh, also have um, Casey Packard, uh, who's a Brooklyn-based art writer. She has bylines at publications that include Art Forum, Bomb, Breeze, and, right. and she's also a regular contributor at Hypoallergic. She's currently working on a book to be released in spring 2013. And um, today we also have Emily Zimmerman, the curator and writer based in Seattle. Since 2017, she's been the director and curator of the Jacob Lawrence Gallery at the University of Washington School of um, Art History um, and design. Um, and we have Rahel um, Ahima, who um, is the associate curator at MoMAS. Uh, she's a Dubai based art critic who also published in four, uh, four column art for Martin America, Art News, um, Art Review. Um, previously, she was based in New York. Now she's based in Dubai. Um, and um, I like to start with uh, with Lois, and um, uh, maybe we can start uh, by discussing um, your uh, your approach to this to this question that that the panel presents um, about what um, leaders can can learn from artists and in, in the art world. Thanks, Osman, and thanks to everybody else for yeah. for being here. Um, Delighted to be on the, on the panel. Uh, most of my art writing is focused on artists who deal with ecological or environmental concerns. Uh, and my background is in poetry. I'm actually an English professor by training. And so a lot of my perspective on this question about leadership and about the value of arts projects with respect to it comes from the perspective of someone who's worked a lot with uh, artists and writers of different kinds who are possibly quixotic in their approach to their work. That is, they're not concerned with nuts and bolts, pragmatic issues of how am I going to get something done? Or, you know, is this, is this feasible? Right. Um, and that's, it's in, in my view, that's something that's easier to do in the arts, right, to, you know, I guess another way to put it kind of uh, in a cliched way would be to dream big uh, because the stakes are kind of lower. If it fails, it's just your project that fails. But uh, I think when you look at a lot of different conversations that are happening in the world today, those two things, right, like think about just, for example, in the United States or, you know, in, in government policy, climate change, right? Uh, you know, what's the needed scale of solutions that scientists are recommending? And then what are the ambitions and proposals that policymakers are, are making? Uh, what's, what's sometimes called the Overton window of acceptable public discourse. 
So uh, as an example of what I, what I mean by all this to make it a little more uh, concrete, uh, there's a Bronx-based artist, the, the college where I teach in the Bronx in New York City, uh, Alicia Grion. Uh, and she had a project about five or six years ago that she called Percent for Green. And Percent for Green was modeled off of New York City's Percent for Art program, whereby 1% of all new construction in the city, this was uh, founded in the early 1980s, was earmarked for public art projects. So if a, construction, a new construction project costs $100 million, $1 million of that had to go towards some sort of public art uh, work funding. Uh, so Alicia came up with a very simple uh, bill proposer that she proposed in um, you know New York City legislature. And that was for 1% of all new construction costs, 1% uh, of all new construction costs would be earmarked as well for um, funding environment, underserved communities that face environmental challenges around, around the city. Uh, and the bill, to my knowledge, never actually passed. But the interesting thing from my point of view, so I guess my comments are going to more leave off as a question. And hopefully when we have the dialogue, uh, this is something uh, it'll speak to other people's uh, uh, presentations and what we talk about. Uh, for me, Alicia's uh, project, Percent for Green, is kind of a Rorschach test of people's cynicism. Right? Because not only is it kind of quixotic and not only was it something that wasn't able to pass as legislature, right? But it's asking for the merest scraps, right? Like 1% of very large amounts. Of so I think those are tensions that leaders can be mindful of. That is, what would you like to do? And what in an ideal world would you do? And what do the constraints of your particular situation suggest may or may not be possible? And how do you negotiate that uh, when it comes to issues? concern and high stakes. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, what about you? What about you, Casey? Sorry? What about you? Uh, you uh, um, are following Louis's um, take on the subject. Yeah. Um, so I definitely see um, a connection with what Louis is saying and kind of <laughs> my thoughts on the prompt, um, which is that there's a lot of overlap between what good artists do and what the people who we might think of as more traditional leaders do. Um, both respond to their historical moment, they're engaging with their respective publics, and they envision other possible worlds while trying to more fully understand our own. And both found themselves confronting new challenges during the pandemic. Um, so I was kind of thinking about artists' responses to the pandemic and the fact that on top of personal and financial pressures, which may have been exacerbated by the pandemic, exhibitions were being postponed indefinitely, um, art institutions were shuttering, and already scarce funding was evaporating. So there is... A specific artwork that really stood out to me in terms of leadership. Um, it was made in the spring of last year, and it took the realities of living in New York City during the pandemic as its subject matter, while it adapted and innovated in direct response to the challenges that those realities posed. Um, so Moroccan-born artist Miriam Banani and Israeli-born filmmaker Orion Barkey were quarantining in their Brooklyn apartment familiar experience when they experimented with their first collaboration, which was a short video in which two lizard avatars navigate New York in lockdown. Um, I wanted to show a quick clip, if you wouldn't mind.
So two lizards end up evolving into a mini series of eight videos, one to three minutes long, which were released episodically on Instagram from March to July of 2020. And the lizards wander around an abandoned Times Square. They watch Zoom birthday parties. They attend Black Lives Matter um, protests. And two lizards painted a picture of the pandemic in real time. And it ended up becoming really emblematic of that period in New York City. And in addition to being popular, it was actually acquired by MoMA. So kind of to what Lewis said, Barky and Banani were able to do what they did when they did it, in part because they were light on their feet. Um, They used Instagram to widely disseminate their work for free at a time when many institutions were closed and large gatherings were prohibited. They used a library of characters that Banani had waiting in the wings. She frequently incorporates animation into her live action video art. They let the episodes evolve from moods and personal experiences and the latest news instead of storyboarding them out. And they let the project kind of snowball into something larger with remote collaborators as people reached out offering to contribute their voices. So last month, Barky and Banani made edition prints of two lizards, which they sold online to raise money for Build Palestine and medical aid for Palestinians. And I see the project's evolution as ongoing as it sort of keeps shape-shifting in response to the needs of its time and the world imagined by its makers. Um, And I highly recommend that everyone watch the series. It's 22 minutes in total, and it's all available on Banani's Instagram. Thank you. Um, um, And uh, and, and, um, Emily, uh, Would you talk about uh, your approach a little bit about the idea? Yeah, extending um, from that question of world building, one of the um, ideas that this prompt led me to was how does one model a new world? Uh, Artists and arts presenting institutions have frequently had to do this, as Peter Sheldahl, longtime art critic for the New York Times, has said, The arts are a great laboratory for the absolutely free play of ideas and emotions that normal social life can't accommodate. As leaders consider the enormous challenges posed by the global pandemic and the need to rapidly adapt to new circumstances, there's much to be gleaned from the type of embodied learning, modeling, and world building that happens in the space of exhibitions. In particular, I'd like to discuss the 2017 exhibition, The Boat is Leaking, The Captain Lied, which came about through a collaboration between writer and filmmaker Alexander Kluge, artist Thomas Demand, stage designer Anna Vliebrock, and curator Udo Kittelman. Taking place across multiple floors of the Prada Foundation in Venice, the exhibition reflected on truth, misinformation, and public life when the phrase alternative facts had just arrived on the global stage. Within the exhibition, stage designer Anna Vibrock created a set of full-size models, including a courtroom, cinema, and a department store display to speak to the themes of artifice and reality, creating a series of subversive spaces to reflect on the deep and pervasive issues of misinformation and the relationship between subjecthood, media, and architecture. I'd like to share a couple of images of the exhibition, just so you have a visual of it. So here's the PowerPoint. Um, This is the storefront display. This is a cinema. This is a kind of hall of doors where you weren't quite sure which ones would open and where they might lead. Um, A stage that you enter from the back, uh, a kind of hotel set set into the lobby of the Prada Foundation. Um, The boat is leaking, the captain lied, upturned some of the standardized narratives surrounding such issues, reordered linear historical accounts, and allowed the nuances of embodied perception and uh, understanding while creating a space for different kinds of relations between subject, media, and architecture. 
Not only can world building through exhibitions help embody current problems, exhibitions can also be a space for speculation about possible alternative worlds. With each exhibition, there's an opportunity to create a vision that asserts what the world might look like. In a world where adaptation is necessary, where those who have access to power, financial resources, and vi visibility needs to shift in the service of promoting diversity for a shared global humanity, modeling at a limited scale, at the scale of an exhibition or of a project in business can be a powerful tool for change making. Um, thank, thank you. And, uh, and finally, Rahel, um, we're um, curious what you. Hi, Viren. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I guess the first thing I do want to mention is that I'm not sure it's a good idea to um, for artists to be trying to innovate. Um, I think that's the thing kind of I primarily responded to, I think, especially with new media and tech art, um, which is very much linked with kind of the development of new hardware. You get artists kind of innovating for the sake of it. Very often you're seeing it in the same way, um, kind of with the NFT boom. Um, and I maybe want to flag that's not always the best thing to do as opposed to maybe a kind of iterative process that does the same thing maybe over and over again. Um, but what I did want to talk about uh, more specifically is, I guess, uh, so I recently moved back to the region. And I've been trying to talk uh, to a lot of artists here. Um, and a Saudi artist was recently telling me about a fungus uh, that survives in the desert here, basically by extracting the DNA of everything around it and incorporating the best bits for itself. Um, and over time, it becomes a very interesting kind of genetic archive of the desert, whether or not it actually uses some of those things, you know, adapts them to its environment or not. Um, and this is a move that artists are very familiar with, maybe to the degree that they can be accused of appropriation or of a very shallow adaptation where you have rigor getting sacrificed for aesthetics. Um, I think this might be the first thing that you can kind of take is look at or leadership can maybe think about is, um, you know, take from the world outside of you, but be careful what you're doing and don't um, adapt for the sake of it. Because I think sometimes there can be this, I'm seeing it very much now, having moved back to Dubai, which is a very tech topic. Um, there's a real emphasis on futurity for the sake of futurity, um, especially in kind of business uh, and foresight spheres here. And I think learning from maybe artists who are a little bit more measured in their taking is uh, would be a useful thing for leaders too. Um, the other thing that you see a lot in this region particularly is an interest in looking backwards in kind of revisiting history, particularly through the archive. Um, and what you also see is um, a kind of turn that's emerged in recent years is towards research art or what's sometimes called kind of forensic art. Um, and examples of this are perhaps the collective forensic architecture and also one of their members, um, Lawrence Abu Hamdan, who are both nominated for the Turner Prize, actually for the same project, weirdly enough, um, in subsequent years. Um, as the name suggests, they adapt the forensic techniques that you might otherwise see in a kind of post-mortem scene um, or, you know, with detective or investigative police work. Um, but they adapt it to human rights concerns, um, like basically a different range of problems at a different range of scales. Um, and what's interesting about this, particularly with thinking about world building, uh, and I think the example, the exhibition was a great example. I remember being really impressed by the way it created space in a way, which in the way that all exhibitions try to do, but I think this one, I think because of the set design was somehow more um, successful at it. Um, but basically here, um, their knowledge kind of um, in this kind of research or forensic art practice, knowledge emerges not from kind of ideating or speculating about the future, um, but really through revisiting the past and reconstructing it, um, which I think is a different way to approach problem solving. Um, not just, you know, what worked, what didn't in the past, but what more can we learn about the past in this way and kind of fill in the gaps um, to move forward from that. Um, and kind of the third thing from this kind of approach is that problems tend to be solved on multiple levels in a kind of multi-pronged approach. Um, you might have something that exists on the level of awareness raising or entirely the aesthetic, 
And the same data that's generated tends to be used or taken to, let's say, the international court system um, and work through these channels there. And I think that is another thing that can be taken away is just kind of like a Shakespearean play, right? You want things to be legible on different levels to different people, but also kind of not put all your eggs in one basket in that way, you know, to have things operate on different levels, um, two different levels of success and also thinking about the immediate, you know, medium and kind of long term. Um, and yeah, I think this kind of things I want to bring up. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll also like to say a few things myself and the, and the prompt made me think about um, healing and chaos as we talk about crisis. And, and that made me think about um, um, many of you also talk, talked about environment building, world building, but uh, specifically work that sort of flirt with uh, what we call relational aesthetics that create discussions and, and interactions and um, sort of dialogue between people who necessarily don't know each other. And I, 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 I thought about Ricky Tranaya's um, um, curry eating uh, exhibitions where people gather at, from MoMA to Serpentine um, to eat curry together. And that's the only thing that combines them. But also uh, more recently, Anna Imhoff's um, When It's Biennale uh, winner performance files, which was sort of uh, this, I guess, falls into the chaos part, which is sort of this chaotic uh, orchestra of uh, human inter interactions. But then um, I also thought about Simon Lee's uh, recent Me Museum project, The Waiting Room, which sort of created this um, uh, uh, healing. Um, ceremonies, uh, especially uh, geared towards uh, Black American women. Um, and there were uh, herbalists uh, of a particular season, um, different meditation rooms, uh, and it was sort of um, taking on, um, it was sort of the continuation of her former uh, project with Creative Time that um, also took over a a space and creative workshops for, for treatment. And um, so in these ideas, they're um, sort of how, but on, on a broader scale, this um, made me think about how artists are always inclined to talk about and uh, gear towards ideas that are first considered um, sort of, um, I guess, scandalous or um, they're, they're sort of uh, before their time. When we look at um, uh, art on um, uh, art on gay rights, women's rights, environment, race, um, artists created work about these subjects before it was in the it was in the, it was in public discussion and in, in the mainstream public discussion. Um, so um, I think one thing to take from or learn from. Um, artists or I don't learn is the right word, but um, sort of looking at what they're talking about right now for a, for just sort of the signifier of um, what the um, mainstream society will be discussing or trying to sort of um, uh, solve in, in, in the next coming years. And um, from that, I like to, um, hearing your 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 opinions, I like to ask each of you um, a question about what you just said. And with so, if I'm I I am very interested in the word quixotic that you use and and the example you gave with um, with the artist who sort of uh, try to bring a, a person for art to the next level. But then you said she didn't necessarily. Um, do it or, or get it, but that's probably not even the point because one thing that is that separates um, art from, um, I guess, being an artist from being a leader in in a sort of a uh, in a situation where where those rules are set, it's that you can be open ended and and while the other one is more more solution based. Um, so with with your example, it's it was more about the attempt and then and, and activism and then the and the way that it turned heads and, and it made people aware of an issue. 
So, um, and maybe you can talk about a little bit about this idea of um, sort of dreaming big, as you said, um, or 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 going for an attempt that does not necessarily or may not necessarily yield um, a result that that's um, targeted. Yeah, the, I, I, I like that question a lot, Osman, and I'm going to connect it to some of the thoughts of some of the other panelists. But the way I would put what you were asking at the very end about dreaming big and whether or not it's likely to succeed, I, I guess the, the business world analogous situation is venture capital, right? Like uh, high risk, high reward propositions. And maybe there's not quite the possible potential payoff with certain visual art projects, but the, the idea of there's also not huge consequences to failure other than, you know, the, the work itself not succeeding. And I can think of social practice works like uh, I think it's Laurie Jo Reynolds's Tam's 10 year project uh, where she um, worked uh, to close a supermax like high security prison in the state of Illinois. Uh, so the, the, the way I want to take your question though in, is to pick up on uh, the theme of world building that came up in a number of the other uh, panelists' uh, remarks and just say that the way I've seen it in a lot of eco-oriented art projects, uh, there are many such projects that basically reflect back to audiences the climate catastrophes that they already know that we're either already experiencing right now or that we already expect rather than a vision of what they would hope could be potential alternatives. I think that was the word that you had used, Emily. Uh, so, you know, if uh, I, I guess I don't want to name specific artists names, but, you know, if you're going to make little vitrines and flood them and say, oh, the world, the sea levels are rising and that's a bad thing, no matter how well made those vitrines are uh it's the flooding and the apocalyptic scenarios of the you know of a climate future that everybody already knows as opposed to like i could think of a lot of different alternatives that uh are doing more interesting things but i'll just name one it was a group show uh at performance space in new york uh, a couple of years back uh called apocalypse right now a wild ass beyond and it was uh three or four different artists american artists uh, i might be i'm going to uh, American artist was one of them, um, Sandra Perry, I want to say. And uh, the simple thing that I'm trying to say is they imagined a climate future where people were kind of fending for them for themselves and trying to figure out that um, and connecting those, you know, ideas about futurist survival and under duress to uh, the lived experiences of um, African-Americans and others right now in the actual world that is. So uh, I think that idea of world building, what's the world that you do or don't want to see and how are you moving towards realizing it or or not is the, is the really interesting question for me that you all brought up. Um, thank you. And um, with, with Casey, I like to, um, one thing that was, I think was interesting that, um, the artist Mary Manani and her partner started the project on Instagram, but uh, eventually MoMA acquired it. So, um, which you know is like is one of the highest um, achievements for mainstream considered for mainstream art. So this sort of uh, somewhat DIY. Uh, attempts sort of born out of limitations and um because as as i was uh as i was thinking about this topic i was thinking about artists who make work in extremely limited conditions such as prison uh or or hospital bed um based on whatever is at hand and then um sometimes uh they never have a chance to show the work or 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 the, the work is discovered after they die. So, and then this project that came out, came out of a uh, sort of a uh, distressing situation and, and, and eventually was acquired by MoMA. So um, the, the, there is that element of uh, achievement, which um, is interesting in, in the span of the 
uh, project. So maybe uh, you can talk about this sort of idea of being uh, end-driven and result-driven or, or how we define success uh, mm -hmm. for, for the art world as we talk about also leadership, which is sort of a different uh, feel. Right. right. I mean, in terms of defining success, um, I'm currently writing a book with advice from artists. And one of the conversation topics that kind of came up is what does this success as an artist mean to you? And I think that there really are as many answers as there are artists. Um, with regards to MoMA um, acquiring the work, I think- I mean, that's just a symbol, but you can talk about in a broader understanding of, you know, could have been Whitney, could have been a collection, could have been more likes on the yeah, yeah. Well, I think the attention that it got on Instagram is very much tied up with MoMA acquiring the work because it, like, the first episode got 186,000 views. Um, it went viral and it, like, I kind of mentioned it became emblematic of this time in New York City for a lot of people, um, especially like in creative fields who were trying to make their art in a time where like, it was not only financial limitations, there was also just the anxiety of the early days of the pandemic. Um, but I would say that Miriam Benani specifically had already established herself as a major figure in the art world. She was in the 2019 Whitney Biennial. Um, the Guggenheim had already acquired her party at the Caps. Um, and so I wasn't super surprised when I saw that the work was acquired um, between like her importance and the cultural significance of it. Um, and it's good that we're living in a time when institutions can accommodate this sort of work. Um, I don't know how they're going to end up showing it, but I know that they did a screening a few months back online with a Q&A. It might still be recorded somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's important that uh, she was already an established artist that it's not just uh, miraculously happened. Um, um, and um, Emily, I'd like to ask you about the, the installation you showed and, and as we talked about world building, um, alternative um, universe building. And what I think was interesting was the ch element of surprise and chance as the, the installation um, sort of allowed for uh, other rooms or, or chance encounters, which is sort of, in my opinion, not welcome. Welcome in uh, in a leadership uh, role. Like, you know, you don't want chances, you don't want surprises, you don't want ambiguity, you don't want the unknown. So, uh, and sort of the installation sort of has its own dynamic that's sort of in a way sort of a maze. Um, so, I'm I'm curious how you um, when you chose a installation did you think about that in relation to uh, leadership or um, yeah. is risk management or, or risks or potentials of you know even failure yeah. I think I was responding to um, the kind of question of like how do you get inside a problem and part of that answer is like make it embodied right to represent the complexities of that problem in all of the ways that we know, and not to discount the intel other kinds of intelligences that um, we, we contain. Um, and also finding ways to represent problems that are complex through complex means. So in my mind, it um, is similar to say a filmmaker trying to edit on a laptop versus editing at scale, or a data scientist looking at a visualization 
on a tiny screen versus like a room sized way of interacting with the data. You see different things, you make different relationships, and you're able to enter and respond to um, whatever that thing is in far more complex ways. Um, so the, the choice of that exhibition was really an argument for embodied knowledge um, and an embodied response to complex issues. Thank you. Now, I was, I'm, as a writer, I'm always interested in chance and in, in also failure and in, 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 in potential out of it. So I'm always, always intrigued. Uh, and Rahal, you um, talked about, you said, uh, take um, take what you want to take, but be careful or be conscious. So I'm, I would like to talk about the ethic. Let's say a, a leader or leaders who watch this panel um, um, actually take, are, are actually inspired and, 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 and write down things, take notes and apply them in their practice um i'm i'm curious what you what do you think about the ethics of um any sort of um inspiration or um uh, exchange of ideas or, or information especially in uh in a, in a dynamic where one field is uh notoriously under compensated or financially challenged um let's say this panel had a direct impact a very tangible impact on um, someone, a leader, or or well, by, by any means. Hi, what do you think about the ethics of 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 the transaction? Yeah, I think um, the first most important thing is citation. You know, I think this is in any trans any time that you're taking information from anywhere else. It might just be this is also a way of I think leveling playing field, which is something that. Like, you know, is talked about a lot. You know, I think a very simple way of saying that this idea came from this place, it came from this person, maybe you want to talk to them too. Um, and I think citation is something that it's it's very loose in the art world. You know, it's kind of like, I will cite another artist or I will cite an art person. But if, if this information comes from a scientist or a person in the industry or whatever else, that's free pickings. Um I think the other thing I think about, and I think you do see this in business, in the business world um, as well, is um, I guess what's in, in film is called the hero's journey. You know, people are traveling along and at a certain point they encounter some information. You know, you have what people sometimes call the like ancient brown wisdom montage. You know, often it's predicated on like this is traditional knowledge. This is indigenous knowledge. This is somebody else's cultural knowledge. You know, I don't get... Um, worked up about appropriation in the same way that I think a lot of people do. But I think the framing and the construction of value around knowledge, you know, which might be something as simple as, I don't know, don't go out with your hair wet. And that spun into a wellness seminar of like, you know, whatever business practices, you know, I think that is something else to think about. Like how does the knowledge get framed and what, it, what value is attached to it? And what is a bo body and or the body of people you know that are attached to that particular lineage whether or not you know how they frame it and how you're adding authenticity or legitimacy or value to it um i think those are the two main ethical concerns you know and obviously fact check you know i mean that's something that you see a lot i think we're getting this whole economy of fact checking with um news media in the last couple of years but i think there is in the art world especially, and I think I would hope not elsewhere, but there is a kind of slip and slide of information or like an aesthetic kind of collage of this thing and this thing. You know, I think you see it in the lecture performance or like I like to think of it as a kind of conjecture performance. Like how is this thing related to this thing, you know, aesthetically or because it's got a similar word or like, you know, it runs. Like I think people just have to be careful and intentional about these links that are made between different knowledges, acknowledge where it's coming from and how it's being presented and the value is created around it. Yeah, thank you. I think this will be a good place to talk about labor um, and, and um, uh, who gets to choose what uh, is distributed as information or what's 
uh, um, what was presented. Um, but we, uh, we're almost done. So, um, but uh, we have three more minutes. So I like to ask if uh, anyone has anything to add onto our um, discussion um, based on um, what we exchanged. If, if I'm coming, I'm getting network unstable things. So if I'm not coming through clear, just stop me. But I wanted to connect something that Rahel and Emily were just saying uh, about embodied knowledge and acknowledging where um, in different kinds of um, individual and cultural histories. And it, it what they were both saying reminded me of how in um, climate art and with the problem of climate change in general, that's a real problematic because it's such an abstract problem that art can make it feel immediate in a way that you, even if you intellectually can wrap your head around it, it feels distant. It's somebody else's problem. It's the future's problem problem, et cetera. Uh, and so I, I kind of want to say as, as, a, as, as a response to that, that I, I really appreciate both of their insistences on the importance of embodied knowledge, but also like my, my background and my focus on, on climate related stuff also makes me aware of the inefficiencies of it. Like you need to do, you need to make things concrete to people, right? Because it doesn't, they, they're not aware of the problem in it in quite with quite the level of urgency, but at the same time, that doesn't, just the awareness doesn't actually change the thing. There, there need to be other. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? We have one more minute, but I think we can go on. Well, I think wrapped up with that maybe is this idea of like art generating empathy and maybe in a less humanistic way than we've traditionally thought of it, but generating empathy that can generate change. And I think that's a form of leadership as well. Yeah. Um, I think also maybe not being so necessarily solutions oriented. I think the two lizards work as a great example and maybe Miriam's practice as a whole of doing things because they're a little silly and fun you know, and what is kind of a silly and fun video kind of exploded because of people's, um, you know, because it was in New York. And I think that's something to think about, you know, as the world is networked, do you need, you know, if this, if the lizards were hanging around a marginal city or in a different country, it would just have not had the same effect and the same reach. Um, but I think there is also a lot to be said of just play, you know, um, joy for the sake of it, you know, which doesn't necessarily have a success or a solution or like a, a problem to solve at the end of it. Yeah. Emily, do you have anything to add or we can just wrap up? No, I was thinking that's a beautiful note to, to end on. Um, the idea of say like uh, Margaret Ortheim talks about a play tank um, as a way to kind of work out complex problems. Um, and uh, the idea of thinkering, uh, tinkering, thinking through tinkering. Um, so yeah, I love that idea of play. Well, thank you. Thank you all, thanks for tuning in. Um, and yeah, thank you uh, for, for the panelists for, for joining and sharing your opinions. Um,